I'm Yvonne Frost. For more than 25 years, my roommate Gavin and I have lived the craft. We've taught that, the craft, and the skills associated with it to tens of thousands of students who have changed and improved their lives. We've published several books. One of which we're very proud is the American edition of Astral Travel. It's also been published in the British Isles and throughout Europe. It's been published in Portuguese. It's been published in Italian. various other languages. We've also published books in Hindi, on Tantra Yoga. We've published books on various aspects of the craft. And they've gone worldwide. Today we're going to look specifically at meditation and astral travel as a way of stilling the mind and reaching upward to levels of spirituality to those who have gone before us and who can reach back down to offer us guidance as we go through life so that we can get through perhaps with minimum pain and maximum growth. Have you ever taken the time just to sit and look into a candle, a, a f the flame of a stove, a fireplace? Have you ever sat beside a flowing river and let your mind flow with the river? Have you ever gazed into a candle flame and just relaxed your mind and stilled it? That's much what we're going to talk about today. Have you ever been to a new place and suddenly felt, I've been here before. I know what's around that corner. I know what's through that door. This is such a well-known experience, so common to the human race, that it's been called déjà vu, meaning already seen. Well, you may have thought you've just been dreaming, but the spirit can travel while the body is idling, while the body is at rest and quiet with no fear of disturbance. This happens to people and it's a wonderful gift that we are blessed with. Nothing to fear. It's a beautiful thing that can put you in touch with other knowledge than is in the material, secular world. The Bhagavad Gita wrote centuries ago comparing the human being to a driver in a chariot. The spirit is the driver that guides the chariot of the body 
and the rains are wisdom. It's a beautiful thought, one that comforts me sometimes. The ongoing spirit that survives from incarnation to incarnation can leave the body and can go places it needs to go. Often we assume that that's just been a vivid dream, but it hasn't. And it can lead to such experiences as déjà vu. It can lead to spirit communication between you and others, whether they are in the body or whether they are only in spirit plane, in spirit levels. One of the cornerstones of craft belief is the belief in reincarnation as a rational prog- process of growth. Those who have gone before us, who have died, can reach back down to help us. They have access to information that we don't have. And when we still the mind in meditation, they can provide us with that information if conditions are right. We'll talk today about making conditions just right. It will include activities you haven't been used to because it's almost un-American to be so still. But it's peaceful. It's the way of communicating with those who've gone before and of gaining information that we could not get otherwise. You may have heard casual talk in the past about guardian angels or fairy godmothers. This is all the same concept. We call those personalities guides. The guides are like you and me, but they're between incarnations. They're not trapped in a body. And they're doing a different kind of assignment than we're doing just now. But part of their assignment may be to reach back down and help us get through in a way that contributes to growth and spiritual development. In meditation, you can go inward, as some popular courses have taught. And that's fine, because it lets you examine your mental attic and throw out some old rubbish that has cluttered your mind in the past. You can go inward, you can go outward, reaching toward those who've gone before. As you go outward and upward to higher levels, you'll find yourself one day traveling among the guides, traveling among those who've gone before, Perhaps you'll attend class in your meditation time on the astral planes. Because this is, another name for this is astral travel. The body is lying quiet like an idling car in its protected condition. The mind, the spirit is traveling to where it can gain new information. To meditate confidently, you'll need to arrange a safe place and use that place every day you're not traveling. The safe place has certain conditions that, are, that may strike you as unusual, and we're going to describe the ideal situation. I don't want you to say, I can't meditate because I haven't got the ideal situation. I hope instead that you will listen to this and learn and that you will begin to set things up, but you won't wait to start meditating because it's a skill that is developed over time and a a habit that becomes customary because it's an everyday thing. So now to describe the safe place where you'll meditate. It's physically safe. I hope you'll lock the door and turn the telephone off It's free of heavy electric current because these contacts with the guys are very subtle. The influences that they will bring to bear upon you are subtle influences. So heavy electric current makes static and disturbs the quiet place in which you are sitting or lying. The place will certainly be free of electronics. No music, no headsets, no none of that stuff. Nothing playing 
to interfere with what you'll be receiving from the spirit side of life. It'll be free of synthetic fabrics because they too make electric currents of a very gentle sort, but nonetheless distorting. I always meditate in a robe of pure cotton. The safe place will not have any animal products in it, feathers or bones or leather or fur or any of that stuff that comes from animals. No horn, hang, horn objects mounted on the wall. No animal products because those animals probably died in pain and terror and you don't want those influences in your safe meditation place. You don't want those old feelings lingering on. The phone off the hook, the door locked, you'll be free of interruption. You'll be free of interruption and confidently know that this 15 minutes is yours. I hope you'll meditate when the sun is below the horizon because the sun's powerful rays also generate static of a sort that can interfere with what you're doing, what you're receiving. I hope this safe place will be relatively free of such white noise as books and newspapers and things that are colored in garish colors screaming, look at me, look at me, pay attention to me, pay attention to me. You don't need that just now. What you need is utter peace. I mentioned the Bhagavad Gita and the concept of the driver and the chariot. Another way of talking about that in this time when we don't use chariots is talking about I and me. I is the spirit that lives from incarnation to incarnation and me is the physical body with its demands and its clamoring to be paid attention to. In meditation, I leaves me parked and goes about I's business. But me is not really dead or catatonic. It's still on guard just a little bit. And me, the body, with your guide, stays on duty to protect you from anything that might occur, from any possible thing. If a real danger should occur, such as if me smells smoke, me and the guide will bring I back in time to do something about it. Never fear. So long as your intention is benevolent, you will be safe. There's one thing that's especially nice to have in your meditation place, and that is any kind of a living plant. It doesn't have to be something you play violin music to, but take good care of the plant and love it and cherish it. Let it know once in a while that you still think about it and you're glad it's there. There are other things you want as well. One is a timer that will tell you when 15 minutes is up. If it's a particularly loud running one, you want to hear the bell, but not the running. So put it night-night under a pillow, an ordinary pillow. Another thing you'll want is a candle, and this should not be scented. But when you cut off all the electric current that's flying around and hitting you in the head, you'll want to get into the circle somehow. So an, a household candle and a little box of matches is good to have. Have some ordinary salt from the grocery store. It's probably in the next aisle over from the household candles. You'll be casting a salt circle. I'll demonstrate that later in the tape. If you live in a place that has carpeting, or there are reasons that you can't put a salt circle directly on the floor, spread a bed sheet over the holy floor and put your salt circle on that. 
keep a, one bed sheet for this purpose only and don't use it for anything else. It might be best to have a dark colored sheet so you can tell exactly where the salt circle is going. Have a notebook and a pen so you can write down whatever happened to you in meditation. You're going to get information, you're going to get impressions, feelings. You'll want to document them and capture them immediately before they fade. You don't need to write a big literary production. Just get the ideas on paper. Nobody's going to check your spelling and your punctuation. Get those ideas on paper. If you choose to meditate in a position sitting up rather than lying down, you'll want a chair that is as free of metal parts as you can get. I found this one at an old flea market for $5, among a bunch of other stuff. It's essentially free of metal, so it's just, it suits my purposes fine. That's the ideal setup for your meditation place. There's one final thing you should bring to it, and that is a head, a mindset that is arranged in a meditative mood. Your motivation is spiritual. It's benign. You're not here meditating because you want to do something bad to somebody. You're not here meditating because you want to ask a big list of things from those who've gone before. You're here to reach upward in spiritual contact in a way that will lead to your growth and nothing else. You've heard a lot about prayer. This is the other side of that coin. The coin has two sides. In the coin in this instance, one side is prayer, one side is meditation. Just as a conversation between two people has two people talking and two people listening, Meditation is when we are courteous enough to listen and receive information. Meditating in this way leads to tranquility and it leads to information from those who've gone before, who are there waiting for the chance we give them to bring information. Now, the next step beyond meditation is astral travel. And to get out consciously, deliberately, with intent from your body, you will need an urgent necessity. This is probably a different department than pure meditation. But if you need to go somewhere without the body to gain information, to look in on a friend who means a lot to you, the urgent necessity will help you leave the body behind in that safe place and go where you need to go in the astral planes. You may go somewhere in this physical world that we deal with every day. You may go upward to spiritual levels to get higher learning. Every case is different and every trip is different. It's up to you. And in the day-to-day -day paycheck world, as most of us do, it's very helpful sometimes to make a list of those things and put the list away from you for your 15 minutes of stillness, mental stillness. Make the list and include on it everything that you need to do, everything, whether it's occupational, or at home keeping house, or whether it's to do with pets, or the car, or the foreman, or the paycheck world, whatever it is, write it down on that do list, and then put the do list into the freezer just before you meditate, just before you enter your meditation setting. It'll be all right. It's filed away in the freezer. And you can come back to it after meditation, not now. 
as you enter the meditation setting, take the bindings off your body. Anything that is a closed circle and other things that are not. Take off your bindings because they hinder the flow of energy, psychic energy, that means you are meditating properly. Unbind the hair. Take off rings and watches and all manner of things that bind your body because me wants to be unbound so it can be on its duty, its aspect of this activity. In the meditation setting, you'll have a low light level. You'll have the temperature comfortable, neither too hot nor too cold. You'll have the candle flame going to light you into the circle. You'll be at peace. You'll be at peace in a condition that we call homeostasis, with all the body's needs met, so that the body, me, will not be clamoring at you. It's I's turn to have 15 minutes of peace for I's own activities. This is all called homeostasis. As you enter the circle and close the salt behind you, close the entrance behind you, you may assume either a sitting or a lying down position. You will clench every muscle in sequence. You've probably read articles about how to do this. Clench your toe muscles, clench, and then relax them completely. Clench your foot and ankle muscles and relax them completely. Clench the muscles in your calves, in your knees, in your drumsticks, and in turn relax each set of muscles. Clench and relax. Clench and relax. Clench the muscles in your buttocks, dare I say the word, and in your pelvis. Clench them and relax them. Clench the muscles in your abdomen and relax them in your back, in your chest, in your neck and shoulders, in your fingers, in your arms, again in your shoulders and neck because that's such a sight of tension. Clench and relax. Get a big contrast between the clenched state and the relaxed state. Pay special attention to the muscles of your face, of your lips, of your tongue, of your scalp and ears. Clench them all in turn. Relax them all in turn. I'm trying to wiggle my ears. There are muscles in there. Maybe you can't see it, but it's happening. Clench them each in turn and relax them until you are as tense as my little cow baby. Just completely, completely relaxed. So that me is not clamoring and I can go. Breathe more slowly than before. Breathe slower and slower. I'm not talking deep. Just slowly. Slowly. And now, think of a time when you were very young. This again is for purposes of contrast. Think of a time when you were very young and somebody misunderstood what you did. You were an innocent little kid and you did something and somebody hurt you bad for it. Either accused you of stuff or paddled your bottom or did something really bad to you. A negative experience. Then contrast that with this meditation time. When you can, work your way through to forgiveness of that person. They were probably doing the best they knew how to do. But it hurt you all the same. Contrast that pain and that anger and that hurt with the safety and the confidence and trust you feel in meditation. In dealing with that negative memory, you may even have to draw a picture of the room that it happened in. But do what you can to forgive and to release that bad emotion that happened to you, that bad hurt and pain. As time goes on, now that you've got your physical meditation place set up, you may want to construct a chamber, a safe place that exists entirely in your mind. And this may be a room, or it may be an open field, or anything where you feel good, where you feel safe. 
It'll be exactly what you want it to be. I call mine my chamber. I have a place to rest there. I have important books there. I have maybe magical tools from time to time. It's all exactly as I want it. It's painted the pale yellow of sunshine because that's my best color. But yours will be the color you choose. And as you build that chamber, stand there in your mind and turn in a circle in your chamber. Revolve your mental body in the chamber and look at every wall. See what it looks like. And if you don't like it or if you're tired of it and have outgrown it, change it until your chamber is exactly what you want. Look at the floor. Look at the ceiling of it. If it has a ceiling or if it's open to the sky, look at that. Make it what you want it to be. And you can go there in your mind, even if you're far away from your physical meditation place. Your chamber is a safe place for your psychic body to travel. Now, we talk sometimes about seeing, about visualizing these things. Most people do see and visualize in the visible sense, when they deal with psychic matters. But a lot of people don't. A lot of people hear things. A lot of people smell things. They may have flavors they experience psychically to give them clues about what's happening or what's coming toward them along the track of time. Clairvoyance is not the only way of receiving psychic impressions or building psychic places. Clairvoyance is visualizing or seeing. Clear audience is hearing, as Joan of Arc said she heard voices. Clear sentience is getting hunches or impressions of just feelings.
too soon. It's time to come back. I close my aura with the other affirmation. I am surrounded by the pure white light of the God. Nothing but good shall come to me. Nothing but good shall go from me. I give thanks. So let it be. Now I'm going to open the salt circle. In a moment or two, I'll have a glass of water to get everything back into sink. And I'll make all those notes in my journal of the impressions I received. Good night and blessed be.